Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Jonathan Taplin in conversation with Mark Weingarten, here to discuss the magic years scenes from a rock and roll life. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter, as well as following us on social media at Book Soup. And you can also follow us here on our Crowdcast page, and past events are also available on our YouTube channel. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, so if you see, so you can submit a question by going to the bottom of the screen, it says ask a question, you can submit there, or if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you can give it a little thumbs up um, on the like button, and we will try to get to as many questions as time will allow. And also please feel free to engage with each other in the conversation in the chat area. Also, please support Book Soup and Jonathan tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen, and that will redirect you to their website, and you can finish the checkout process there. It shouldn't interrupt your viewing. It should open in a new window, so you can do that at any time. And we're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro, FM, and Kobo for those interested. We're also open for in-store browsing. So if you're local to Los Angeles, please stop by the store from daily from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. and we'd love to see you. And with that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. Jonathan Taplin is an author and director emeritus of the USC Annenberg Innovation Lab. Taplin's book, Move Fast and Break Things, How Facebook, Google, and Amazon Have Cornered Culture and Undermined Democracy, was nominated by the Financial Times as one of the best business books of 2017. Taplin has produced music and film for Bob Dylan and the band, George Harrison, Martin Scorsese, Wim Wenders, Gus Van Sant, and many others. He currently sits on the boards of the Authors Guild, Americana Music Association, and Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti's Council on Technology and Innovation. Our other guest tonight, Mark Weingarten, is a writer and filmmaker in Los Angeles, the author of three books and the editor of two anthologies. Weingarten also produced the documentaries God Bless Ozzy Osbourne, and the other one, The Long Strange Trip of Bob Weir. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Jonathan and Mark. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, thanks so thanks. much. Hi, John. Hey, Mark. How are you? I'm good. I enjoyed your book a great deal. Thank you. Talk about a long, strange trip. <laughs> yeah, it's really something, and there's much to discuss. And, and we'll talk about Bob Weir on the train across Canada. Oh, yeah, the Festival point. Express, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I've talked about it. With him. Uh, <laughs> but before we get into all of that, why don't we have you read an excerpt from the book? Okay, so this is the very beginning of the book, and it's in 1965. Strapped to a Fender Stratocaster electric guitar, Bob Dylan launched into the opening chords of Maggie's Farm almost before the band was ready. The Newport Folk Festival of 1965 was going to close with a commotion. I had just turned 18 and was an apprentice road manager for Dylan's manager. The explosive moment launched me on a lifelong journey, one beyond anything I could have imagined at the time. I was standing in the stage wing, transfixed, 10 feet from the band. Mike Bloomfield, acting like band leader, brought his Butterfield Blues Band rhythm section, Sam Lay and bassist Jerome Arnold, into some approximation of sync with Dylan's rhythm. Al Cooper, in a loud polka dot shirt, hunched over the Hammond organ and did his best to fill in the spaces, but it wasn't starting well. I ran out to the mixing booth in front of the stage where Peter Yarrow had commandeered the board. It was worse out front. In his nervousness, Bloomfield kept raising his guitar volume and was now drowning out everything else. The first tune ended on a sour note and there was only light applause from the audience. I gazed behind me and a look of shock seemed to be the dominant emotion in the sea of blue work shirts and peasant blouses. The man in the tight pants, orange shirt and dark glasses was not their Bob Dylan. What was going on? A chorus of boos filled the air before Bob started his radio hit, Like a Rolling Stone. But by the end, the fans were still booing. Voices from the crowd called for their favorite tunes from the folk era. The band looked nervous, but without a word to the audience, Bob plunged into It Takes a Lot to Laugh, It Takes a Train to Cry. 
The band found their groove, but when the tune, tune ended, the booing got worse. Dylan turned to Bloomfield and said, let's split. To the surprise of the other musicians and the road crew, he unplugged his fender and walked off the stage. Instantly, the crowd went silent. People started yelling at each other in the aisles. Look what you did. He's gone, asshole. Peter Yarrow bolted from the mixing council, and I followed him backstage. Dylan was sitting on the bottom steps of the stairway leading up to the stage. He was clearly shaken, rubbing his eyes. Peter ran up to the stage and seized the microphone. Hey, show Bobby that you love him. Let's get him back. The audience roared approval. Dylan sat still on the steps. The audience began to clap in rhythm. Dylan refused to budge. Peter appeared at the top of the stairs, pleading with him to return. Johnny Cash wandered out of the artist's tent, holding an acoustic guitar. For a moment, he watched the triangular drama of Peter, Bob, and the crowd. He moved over to Bob and handed him the guitar. Play them a song, son. <laughs> Bob took the guitar and slowly walked up the 30 steps of the stage. When he appeared in a lone spotlight holding the acoustic guitar, the cheers from the audience were deafening. He leaned towards the microphone, raising his harmonica holder. Does anyone have a D harmonica? Out of the crowd, three of Honer's finest sailed through the air onto the stage. Dylan danced out of the way and grinning, picked up one and placed it in the holder. He started to strum the guitar and sang, it's all over now, baby blue. When he finished the song, he rushed through Mr. Tambourine Man, then turned and without a word, walked quickly off the stage. He had said his piece, they did not own him, and like a lover leaving a bad relationship breakup, he would not turn back. I love that. It's so interesting to hear that from your point of view because obviously that is such a foundational moment in the, of the entire decade of music, right? Such a schism, such a definitive before and after split between where Dylan was coming from and where he was going. But obviously in the moment, in retrospect, we, these things take on epic contours. They take on the mythic. But it, it, when you were there witnessing all this, what was your feeling that it was a disaster? Well, it was partially a disaster in the sense that Bob had not rehearsed with the band. If he wanted to present rock and roll, he could have done a better job of doing it. And, and quite frankly, he only made up his mind to do it at the last second. I had come to Newport just wanting to go to the festival and I'd been a fan of Dylan's. And my brother, my older brother, knew this guy named Paul Clayton, who was a friend of Bob's. Mm -hmm. And Paul got me a backstage pass and introduced me to Albert Grossman, who was Bob's manager. And Albert hired me for the weekend to be the road manager for the Jim Queskin Jug Band, which was right, one right. of his groups. Right. 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 And Albert was like the Pasha of folk music. He, yes. he managed Bob Dylan, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Odetta, Paul Butterfield, everybody. Yeah. So, I mean, it was like being let into the inner sanctum. And for an 18-year-old kid, it was amazing. So, I mean, I, I don't really think I, I had a sense of what a, a, a momentous thing it was at the time. I, I knew that Bob had already wanted to play rock music. He had a he had a radio hit called Like a Rolling Stone that was doing quite well. So it wasn't like this was some big surprise. But the point to do it at the Newport Folk Festival was a kind of aggressive move, to put it mildly. And of course, the folkies, the folkies saw rock and roll as some ultimate sellout. You know, that it was that, that that's that's what Elvis, oh, yeah, no, that was, you know, that was, that was yeah, no, forget that. right. And, so you, and yeah, yeah. So you found yourself right at the inflection point of a very exciting moment, to be told, sure. right? Um, but I wanted to just skip ahead for a minute uh, because 
in your in the middle part of your uh, fascinating career, you produced Mean Streets, the Scorsese film. And the protagonist in that film, the Harvey Keitel character, sort of grapples with his sort of Catholic face, faith versus um, his desires, his earthly desires, many of them sinful desires. And I find, what I found fascinating in your book is that your life has a similar through line. You were raised in a very sort of conventional way. You still maintain, you still practice religion, correct? Right. You practice your faith. Right. Um, and then you talk about in the book how you sort of, um, how Dylan and this kind of thing was a kind of faith that you clung to only to sort of become disillusioned later by the music scene and finding yourself. I mean, I think your life's just been this quest to sort of find meaning with all these things in your life, if I'm, if I'm, if right. I'm say so. Um, so tell me a bit about that journey of your life. That, that arc of sort of like, your father was a very successful lawyer, he wanted you to go to Harvard, you said fuck that, you know, and then you got involved in um, the civil rights movement, right. so what kids, you know, what kids did in those days. So just talk a bit about faith, desire, yeah. and my career. So, you know, when I was first went to boarding school, we were taught not just Latin and Greek, because we had to take them both, if you can believe that. Right, right. But we also studied the classics in the sense of the, the philosophy. And I came upon, as a 14-year-old kid, this philosopher named Epicurus. And I'll just read this one thing from the book. As a young man far away from my home in Cleveland, friendless and adrift, I took readily to Epicurus's view of what made a good life, which he broke into three elements, the company of good friends, the freedom and autonomy to enjoy meaningful work, and an examined life built around a core faith or philosophy. At the moment I came upon Epicurus, I had none of these three elements, and I had no idea how to obtain them. I would spend my life trying to achieve all three with varying levels of success. And over time, I came to understand that enjoying autonomy and an examined life in particular are more elusive than they appear, especially to a 14-year-old. So, I mean, I, I think the, the quest is always, my father wanted me to be a lawyer. And he was a lawyer. And he wanted me to follow. I went to Princeton because he'd gone to Princeton. And I was going to go to Harvard Law School because he was, went to Harvard Law School. And then he got cancer in my senior year at boarding school and in my freshman year of college, he died. And the strange thing was that, in a way, it released me to pursue another dream, which was that I had come into this music business and I could see that was actually a way that people were making money in the music business. And it was so much more enticing to me than being a lawyer sure. that I, I, I just didn't even consider that. And of course, I never told my father that I wasn't gonna be a lawyer, but once I I could see how to do that, and and all through Princeton, I worked as a road manager for Grossman on the weekends. Right. Wow. And and so that was kind of much more fun than being in an all male institution like Princeton every weekend. Sure. You know, you're out in the road, and there were beautiful women, and of course, fun times, and and you know, uh, so. That pursuit, I mean, I think you're right in the sense that the, the, the role that Harvey plays in Mean Streets, which is really Marty's doppelganger, right? Yes. This is Marty's right. problem yeah. right. of, of being a, a kid who was going to be a priest right. Right. And, and then falling in love with the movies and the beautiful girls and all right. of that and, right. 
realizing he wasn't going to be a priest. Right, right. So right. Um, I think that happens to a lot of people. You know, you, you think you've got a path set, and then something comes in and, and kind of throws you a curve. And and the cool thing is, if you still, if you continually stay open to it, to the, the curves being thrown to you, you'll you'll have an interesting time. I mean, I was deep into the rock and roll business in six, I mean, I moved to Woodstock in 1969 before the Woodstock Festival. And that's oh, yeah. where Dil that's where Dylan and the band were living. Right. And you were at Big Pink, right? I mean, yeah, you know. we started touring, and then we went to the Woodstock Festival, and you know, by you know, then we went to London, and it was young, but the business was relatively young then, wasn't it? It was, it was kind very of like, young. It was a lark. The musicians were young. You were young. Totally. This whole totally. business was just getting underway. What I mean, an exciting time. And then the music itself had so much relevance, too. It was a, you, you were working for something that you believed in. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I was 21, and the musicians that I was working for were 25. Right. right? And, right. and so elders. Uh, <laughs> they were the elders, right? And, you know, we, we went to, to England to play the Isle of Wight Festival with – Bob Dylan, 150 grand, right? Yeah, and that was like, whoa, what a paycheck, you know. And then we're in this manor house rehearsing, and this guy comes and says, "Well, the Beatles are coming in 15 minutes." That story, then, wild. And, then, and this helicopter lands in the backyard, and it's just like Hard Day's Night. Out of the helicopter jumps, you know, John. George and Ringo and their wives. Paul had stayed in London because his wife had just had a baby. Uh, but, you know, that was the kind of lucky kind of a thing. Looseness. Yeah, very loose and very yeah. funny and everybody joking and and yeah. everybody sharing kind of similar music tastes. They all loved Buddy Holly. They all loved Gene Vincent. They all the loved this rock and roll stuff. Yeah. Exactly. And they all knew those same tunes because the Beatles had been a bar band. Oh my God. And the band the band had been oh, when they were the Hawks. When they were leave on the Hawks, they were a bar band. Well, they both had bottles being thrown at their heads. Yeah. 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 Um and if, so you do get embedded with Dylan and the band and that whole world and Grossman. Before we move on, just tell me a bit, Grossman's such a fascinating figure to me. And of course, we've read about him and we've seen him in Don't Look Back and he's kind of um, quite imposing. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about Grossman and what you learned from him. So Albert was the complete opposite of what you would have think of the Broadway Danny Rose showbiz manager he was very refined cultured incredibly refined yes he 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 was not a glad hander at all he was very internal held in he he had a, a long ponytail gray hair pulled back into a ponytail and these little ben franklin glasses long before i mean he really looked like ben franklin had come into the 20th century yeah, and so he looked like an he looked like a, a CCNY professor. <laughs> yeah, he, he was, and he was substantial. He was, he wasn't fat, but he was big. He was there, and and he was also very imposing in the sense that he, if he t said somebody to get that person out of the room, I mean, you you've seen Don't Look Back. He yes. he was very protective. Yeah. And, and his sense of protectiveness was also that he didn't think, for instance, in, in the 60s, there were all these TV shows that were showing rock and roll. There was Hullabaloo I wrote and, a book Shind about it. and Shindig, right? I wrote a whole book about it. Really? Yeah. And, and Albert, Albert didn't think you should ever do Hullabaloo or Shindig. He said that was death. <laughs> he said that was death. He said, you wait until Ed Sullivan asks you to be on his show, and then you go on his show. And that's all you do. 
right. and you you make it very hard for them to get to you until Ed Sullivan says okay. It's and the that's opposite the of what we do now. It's the opposite of what we do now. Now right. is carpet bombing on social media, right? A complete pincer movement on every available technological right. thing. This was like cultivating an air of mystery. This was oh. saying, and you mentioned that too, like the band didn't go on tour at first when they came oh. up with the first record. Dylan didn't do everything, you know, he right. held back. It was this air of mystery and, and an Completely. Aura. And Grossman was brilliant at that. Yeah. I mean, when we, we did a, uh, the band and, and Dylan did a benefit for Woody Guthrie in 1967. Yeah. And Bob had not been seen in public or had a picture taken of him since the motorcycle accident. And Albert <laughs> decided that nobody could take his picture. So they made everybody coming into Carnegie Hall open their pocketbooks, get frisked, no cameras, nowhere. Uh, Dylan but, said, what's this? Okay, go ahead. One person stuck a Minox into his cowboy boot, was working for the Daily News, right? and, and he snuck a camera in, and from the balcony, he took a picture, and it was on the cover of the Daily News the next morning. Dylan emerges. Albert was so pissed off. I mean, can you imagine, John, one picture? I mean, right. it's just like... Right. And Dylan still does this because I went to the Beacon shows. You know, he does those Beacon shows every year. Right. And I went to the Beacon shows two years ago, and they wouldn't allow cell phone pictures. And I was thrilled because people were actually <laughs> looking at what was going on. Right. right. <laughs> but anyway, but that's, just, right. that's, that's a side note. So what, I also want to talk about sort of a te the testing of your faith in this whole music and scene, uh, specifically when drugs and alcohol started really taking its toll on the band and well, everybody. I mean, right. you know, everybody was fucking doing it. So it's like, I know for you that was, and as a road manager, it's the toughest possible. Scenario. Completely. Talk about that for a second. Well, you know, I think, Things changed radically. I mean, the, the early 60s was a very kind of political time. And, you know, we were all still politically involved. And then, of course, in 1968, um, uh, something happened. You know, obviously, 68, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, King, the Tet Offensive. Uh, yeah. And so, in in some sense something very strange happened and it was like screw politics you know it'll only break your heart the people that we had put our deepest faith into had had somehow cynicism crept in gotten killed and so i just dived into it but but what really happened was that we went from a kind of nice, easy pot culture of the 60s to all of a sudden white powders getting introduced into the scene, both in cocaine and heroin. And that was so dangerous in so many ways. And I mean, the first indication was, you know, I had gone with Albert Grossman to the Monterey Pop Festival. Right. And the Sunday night, Jimi Hendrix, Otis Redding, Janis Joplin were just like the the killers. They were so good, and and yet in a year and a half they were all dead. And so now, Jimmy was just reckless. Janis didn't want to kill herself. I mean, I was close enough to her to know that she was in a good place that at that point when she was making that record, she was just lonely and all alone and yeah. and probably got scored something that was a lot stronger than what she thought it was, whatever. Yeah. For the band, it began, you know, Richard began to drink a lot 
and then Rick and Levon both got into hard drugs. And that gets hard. You know, you, you as tour managers, sometimes you got to get people up in the morning to get on an airplane to go to Chicago. And I mean, I had Levon come after me with a Bowie knife once just because he didn't want to get out of bed, you know, and and just get the fuck out of my room. You know? and he was doing heroin as well. So in that sense, uh, it was very hard for me, you know. So what, what got worse was uh, that in a way he – the band began to have – internal struggles and then then it really showed up when you know eric clapton you know i did the concert for bangladesh and right. i had to eric clapton was the lead guitar player right and all of a sudden you know we're having this incredible hard time getting this heroin addict on stage mm -hmm. and and went through many battles for that, and it was really a problem, you know. Did you think I'm done? I'm out, or what was your attitude? Yeah, yeah. My attitude was, can I find something else to do? Right, right. Yeah. You know. Right. You know so, uh, yeah. So I my attitude was, can I, can I find a way? to make a living that isn't filled with this. And I was lucky enough that a guy named Jay Cox, who was a writer for Time Magazine said, well, if you go to California, I said, I'm gonna to go to California and see what the movie business is like. And he said, well, when you go out there, look up my friend, Marty Scorsese. He's a, a editor and he edited Woodstock. And um, you would like him because he loves the band's music and you you should you two should get together right. so i came out and um i met him and we had a, a fabulous time and i was so naive i just didn't understand that you weren't supposed to spend your old your own money making movies you know they they have that saying, OPM, other people's yeah, money. Other people's money. Yeah, yeah. Nobody told me about that. <laughs> and so uh, I but just... that's how it works. You have to be like... I just got in this incredibly hard situation where I, I convinced a friend to put up money, and I put up money, and uh, somehow we, we were able to make the movie. We're talking about Mean Streets, by the way. We're talking about the movie Mean Streets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we we came out and and we we made this movie. It was amazing. I want to back up though, because you have some incredible stories in the book. Just these anecdotes. You know, happenstance plays such a role in this world, and people didn't even realize it. Uh, Robert Frank, <laughs> I love all that business. So. You are somehow embedded with the stones. I can't remember how now. How did you get into, attached to the stones? So what happened was after the concert for Bangladesh, I got a call from the stones manager saying, we're, we're interviewing people to, to run the tour to support this album called Exile in Main Street. That's it. Right. So I went, they sent me a ticket to go to the south of France where they were all hang out in tax exile right. and um uh, they we had an a interview at one o'clock in the afternoon and maybe around four o'clock people started to show up and breakfast you know we have we have this meeting and keith richards is not there and mick keeps asking the butler to go upstairs and roust keith at Hallerbed. And you know, sometime around seven at night, Keith shows up for breakfast, right. and and you know he's scratching his neck and he's yeah. he's yeah. drinking five seven espressos, and I, I just I just gone through it with Derek Clapton, and I thought, yeah. oh man, one night was bad enough, but I'd have to do this 
every night of the week uh, is I, I, life is too short. So I said to Joe Bergman, their manager, I know I haven't been offered the gig, but I want to withdraw my name from consideration. So I went, I went home, I went home to California, and about three months later, Mick showed up in Bel Air, rented a house, and I got a call from his secretary. He said, "Would you come to dinner?" Mick wants some ideas for an album cover, and he loves the album covers you've done with the band. And so I'm walking out the door, and I just spied Robert Frank's book, The Americans, which, if anybody hasn't ever looked at it, it's the most extraordinary book of photographs. Remarkable. And it was a trip that Frank took across the country uh, at in 1955, and there are pictures of cowboys next to jukeboxes or black preachers by the side of the river, you know, I mean, it's just bluesy. And he is Swiss. Yeah. Yes. And so I, I came to dinner, we had a nice dinner, and I gave Mick the book, and I said, look, everybody knows what the Rolling Stones look like. You don't need your picture on the cover. Just put one of these pictures, like this cowboy at the jukebox or something, on the cover. It's just... It, the title is Exile on Main Street. That's what it says it all. Yeah. And Mick just flipped through the book and he said, these are amazing pictures. Let's get this guy to take our picture. Right. I said, no, wait a minute. That's not the idea. These pictures were taken in 1955. I said, I don't even know if this guy is still alive. And Jagger said, just find him and tell him we'll pay him 20 grand. Don't yeah. Yeah. And... So I, that was my job, and and I eventually found him. And it's a great story, though, because you have so Jagger put Robert Frank up in the Beverly Hills Hotel while Jagger was in his Bel Air place, and it wasn't getting done. The photo shoot wasn't happening, and then ten days go by. Right, finally Frank comes in. I, I'm sorry, I'm telling the story because it's so great. No, 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 I'll, 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 and he's throwing it on the cameras, and they're like, "What the fuck was that?" Yeah. So, I mean, the manager, Marshall Chess, was pissed off. He said, I'm spending 700 bucks a night for this guy. And, and you know, we were going to dinner at Mick's house every night. And Robert would tell him stories of Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. And Mick was just loving it. And occasionally I'd see Robert going through the wastebasket in Mick's study and putting things in his pocket. And he had this little Super 8 movie camera, which he was just shooting like 15 seconds of frames off everywhere. And eventually the, the manager said, either he takes a picture or I'm sending him home. So we went down to Grand Central Market. Keith got there late, so the light was going. He got like two pictures. It was like ridiculous. And Marshall just said, okay, that's it, he's gone. And Mick said, okay, but pay him the $20,000. Right. I thought it was really amazing mensch kind of thing to do, you know. Oh. And and so we I you know, I took him to the airport, gave him his check, and I thought that was the end of it. And two weeks later, the entire exile on Main Street cover shows up with little strips of, of the Super A these little pieces of paper that Mick had written lyrics on were pasted on some old Robert Frank pictures, everything. It was like a Rauschenberg. It was brilliant. It was like a Rauschenberg. It's one of yeah. the great designs of all time. It's one of the great yeah. albums. And it won the Grammy for best record cover. <laughs> uh, then Mick made the mistake of inviting Robert Frank on tour with him. And he made a movie called Cocksucker Blues. I've seen it. You have seen it. I have never seen it. Oh, you haven't seen it? No, I've never seen it. I hear I it's pretty it. randy. I saw it in the 80s in a theater in L.A. I can't remember which one. And I was stunned. I don't know if people even know what it is. Explain what it is. Well, it's it's a kind of backstage look of what happens when a bunch of fairly crazy musicians get together with girls who are up for anything and uh it was not 
not great concert footage, I don't think. Incredible things were happening in that. In, in that. Yeah, but but you know they thought they would get sued, so they they've tried to keep it out of circulation, and I think they've been fairly successful. What did you gain? I'm not talking about financial. What did you gain creatively from producing movies that you couldn't get from managing bands? Well, uh, perhaps a little autonomy, <laughs> you know, in the sense that you are your own boss. Uh, if you're a road manager, you're constantly at beck and call and, and you're expecting the 2 a.m. phone call that Richard Manuel has run his car off the road and, you know, uh, the cops are there, you know, I mean, that's kind of expected. And so that's, that's okay life for a 23 year old kid. But as you get 25, 26, you begin to want a little more control. And look, I did make some mistakes in the sense that I thought that the movie business would be really professional and everybody would be out oh, under control. But but then, you know, I made a movie with Nick Nolde and Cole oh. Under Fire and realized that, you know, actors can be just as crazy as rock and rollers. Very interesting <laughs> cat. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But still, you're producing. You probably had, you know, you're working closely with directors. You're, it's storytelling. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, look, the one thing you do find out as a film producer is it's a director's medium. Mm -hmm. So you've got to check your ego at the door for sure. Mm -hmm. Because if, if the, if the director isn't in total control of what's going on, right. it's going to be a disaster. Right. And the couple of movies I've made where that wasn't happening, it was was not a good outcome. Sure. Um, so, but when the direct when the director really knows what he's doing, and all the actors are looking right to him for the answer, and all the crew is looking right to him for the answer, it's it works. You, you know, know wonderful films you made to die for, correct? Yeah. Until the end of the world, which yeah. is really, which until the end of the world, I think has been rediscovered. Yeah. 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 I think so. I mean, yeah. Vin Vendors and Gus Van Zandt and Marty and, he, and and even Roger Spottiswood, who did Under Fire, who 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 didn't have the career he should have had, but is was a great director who oh, yeah. really knew what he was doing, and so. Those were uh, extraordinary experiences. Oh, I bet. All right, I need uh, a couple more anecdotes here before we take questions. One of which is, you know, it's funny for me from my perspective as someone who, you know, grew up listening to these records and really caring about them, and then hearing the circumstances by which these things came about. And I'm thinking specifically of the 74 Dillon tour and David Geffen's Queen's Gambit maneuver, which allowed him to do Tour, can you explain exactly how that went down? Yeah. So, talking about the 74 comeback tour with Dylan and the band where they played arenas all over the country, right? Yeah. Okay. So, David is an extraordinarily ambitious person. You think? And, and, <laughs> and he also is a person who has some grudges. Mm -hmm. And one of his grudges was against Clive Davis, who was the president of Columbia Records. Mm -hmm. So Bob Dylan had been signed to Columbia Records since the beginning, since if, since John Hammond discovered him in 1962. Right. So Dylan has gone on essentially hiatus, and his contract with Columbia is up. And so Geffen sets a plan that somehow he's going to get Dylan away from Columbia Records. So his move was first he he starts romancing me, you know, taking me out, inviting me to his soirees with Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson and 
Joni Mitchell and everything. Uh, then he asked me to introduce him to Robbie Robertson. So then I get <laughs> left on the side and Geffen takes Robbie Robertson and his wife in a private jet to Paris with Joni Mitchell, which is the famous song, I Was a Free Man in Paris. And Robbie falls in love with him, right? And then David next says to Robbie, would you introduce me to Bob? And so Robbie arranges a, a dinner with Bob. And before the dinner is over, David has planned a comeback tour with Bill Graham producing 40 dates, millions of dollars, and, and two albums uh, of Planet Waves, right. uh, then a live album. Right. And, and, and Bob says, I'll do it, but I'm not going to sign a contract with you. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob ultimately got the ultimate revenge because David got his two records. Uh, but then Bob went back to Columbia. So David never, <laughs> David never really scored what he wanted to, although for a while he was in People magazine ushering Cher around. It was kind of his beard uh, yes. everywhere. And uh, he got what he wanted, which was oh, to screw Clive Davis for, for two years and and get Bob Dylan to the Asylum. Well, now I have to ask. Well, And both albums did quite well. The Asylum records were both number one. Like, right. Uh, so I have to ask you, I mean, you could, it's up to you how you want to, uh, your impressions of the man, the inscrutable one we know as Dylan. What, what were your impressions of him working with him? He's very, he's very quiet. He's he's not. Uh, I mean, he sometimes tells funny stories, but he's pretty, he's pretty self-contained, mm -hmm. and he's very work-oriented. He really oh. wants. I mean, when we were in. In, at the Isle of Wight, he was, he just wanted rehearse. He wanted it to be great because he had been in London uh, a few years before and, you know, they'd been booed off the stage mm -hmm. at the Royal Albert Hall. So he right. wanted it to be great. And it was, it was one of the best concerts he ever did. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I think in a sense, Bob, I mean, if you had asked me in 1969, would Bob still be on the road in 2021? I would say, you're crazy. But maybe he's like George Jones or one of those people who just the road, the road is what gives him life. Sustenance. Yeah. And so it's great. You know, you know what? I'd love to just trade stories with you since you wrote a book about one of the dead is the trans Canadian tour. Uh, we're talking about the festival express tour yeah. through Canada. On yeah. the I mean, that was, for me, that was a pretty amazing thing in the sense of watching all these musicians play together in a, what we used to call the hotel room set, mm -hmm. right? In other words, when the concert was over, everybody would come to the hotel and, and there would be acoustic guitars, yeah. not electric guitars, and everyone would yeah. jam. Yeah. And and so we had this train that we went across Canada on mm -hmm. and we were playing in Montreal and we played in and the tour was the band, the Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Ian and Sylvia. Delaney and Bonnie, Buddy Guy, uh, Buddy Guy and a, a couple other people. I can't remember who else. And Gordon Lightfoot. And the evenings or the afternoons going through from Winnipeg to Calgary, which was a long road, Rick Danko and Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir and Janice just sang like it was amazing and a lot of it was like hank williams stuff and stuff you wouldn't think the dead would really know but they knew it all oh, they know all that stuff. and 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 so at some point the dead ran out of pot and 
So Jana suggested that they try Southern Comfort, which was this liquor that she liked, which is kind of a sweet, it's a horrible drink as far as I'm concerned. Oh my God, it's rock gut. Right. And, um, but Jerry got into it and I think Bob did too. And, and next thing you know, they've drinking up all of Janice's Southern Comfort. And we and see this in the movie. It's great. She, she was pissed off. And so oh, she demanded they stop the train mm -hmm. <laughs> to find a, a liquor store. And the conductor said, well, there's an Indian reservation about 50 miles up the track. Maybe they have a liquor store there. And so sure enough, we took a collection, got $500, went in and there was a liquor store and by some miracle they had southern comfort and jack daniels you and gotta have booze on the train we, we came answer. back we were heroes <laughs> and then, and then no, that night that, that night janice drank danko garcia and oh, we're man. under the table they and were that, passed out that's saying something yes that's really saying something <laughs> right you know uh, well, you see the bottomy in the film. It's so wonderful. When yeah. They're rain and they're all kind of, they're all half in their cups. Right, and right. Like old folk songs. It's wonderful. Right. And you, and you didn't, you, and it's sort of a, um, it's sort of worlds colliding because the dead and the band were two different camps, you know, an East Coast camp and a West Coast camp. And yeah. It's nice to see them come together in that film like that, you know. But they did share a certain love of certain kind of folk music, too. They loved all American music. Right, right. I mean, we yeah. call it Americana now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, they love, but you, in the book, you said they loved, they liked Muddy Waters, they liked Duke right. Ellington, they liked the coast, right. they liked, yeah, you know, right. all that stuff. Right. Anyway, all right, we can talk all night, but we should probably, are there questions we can take? I see Pat. there's one there's one question there. One question. Let me see if I can click onto this thing. Okay. Here is a oh, this is a good question. Do you feel the Once Were Brothers documentary on the band was accurate given comments and legal action against Robbie Robertson taken by Levon Helm? That's a good question. So this is a complicated story, but uh, you know. The, the the truth of the matter is that in music from Big Pink, Richard and Rick each wrote two songs. Right. Levon didn't write any song. Uh, on the band album, the second album, Richard and Rick each wrote one song. Right. And by the third album, Richard and Rick wrote no songs. And it wasn't from lack of Robbie asking them to write songs. It was drugs. They, they were just having too much fun. Yeah, they were. And, and you know, so I would watch Robbie get up every morning, and he was in his studio writing songs for, you know, Stage Fright and for Cahoots and all those albums afterwards. He had to carry the whole weight. And... So nobody at that time asked to have any kind of co-writing credit on the on the, any of those songs. I mean, they were Robbie's songs, all the words, all the music, fully baked, brought into the studio. Of course, a drummer is going to give it a certain kind of feel, but that's that's not songwriting. Mm -hmm. And and here's the deal. In 1969, it would not make any sense to think that the only people who were going to get any money out of the music business post-2000, post-Snapster, would be songwriters. Mm -hmm. But because Levon continued to make a very good living off of record royalties all the way through the 90s because... Mechanics. Everybody, everybody got rid of their LPs and replaced them with CDs. So the band catalog kept selling mm -hmm. and the royalties kept accruing. Mm -hmm. And so Levon was making at least $100,000 a year from record royalty. Right. Uh, then in 2000, Napster hit and that just stopped. And, but 
what happened with the songwriters was that ASCAP and BMI continued to collect from every Gap store that was playing music in the background, from every bar that was playing music, from every movie that, that put stuff in the background. They just continued to, so all of a sudden the songwriters were the only people who were making any money. Right. And that was obviously irritating to leave on because sure. he was broke uh, and Robbie was still making some money. But that's 2020 hindsight to say, well, Robbie should have given Levon all that money because Levon didn't write any songs. And and the one song that he really did contribute to was a song called Life is a Carnival. And and he he had the whole rhythm to it. And Robbie gave him half the songwriting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I I think it's sad that people think that, but it's just, from my point of view, as, as someone who was there, it's just not true. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear, you know, I've heard these things, and even from Levon himself and his doc told everyone that it was over by stage fright because they were too uh, out of their minds to even right. get into the studio. And I've heard Rundgren, who is the engineer, and Todd Rundgren, who's the engineer in that record, trying to rouse them out from under the control uh, or, you know, like they would yeah. have out in the control room. And yeah. Well, it was a real mess, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, you know. And, you know, I mean, as for Robbie breaking up the band, I mean, he just had, he tried to keep it going as long as he could, but it was really painful, I know. especially yeah. in, in 1975. Yeah. And, and so he said, let's call it quits. Yeah. No, I mean, he just, I'm sure he just threw his hands out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, the guy got that glorious movie that he made. Yeah. Which only had one camera on Muddy Waters. I know that story. Muddy was on and all the cameras went out except for this one camera. Do you, you know that story? Uh, no. And they shot money because Scorsese had all these cameras and he had these incredible cinematographers, you know, the last waltz. Right. He had Michael Chapman and he had all these guys. Right. There was a technical glitch and all the cameras went black except for one. And the thing you see in the movie is that one camera shooting Muddy Waters. Well, doing <laughs> and that's that's because that's because Laszlo took his earphones off. Marty was trying to tell everybody what uh, thing to be on, and and we, had, you know, because you were shooting film, you had to stop every ten minutes because the right. magazines were there, and so Marty didn't realize that Manish Boy was I'm a man, and right. so he said we'll do Caledonia. You know, and uh, so, you know, I mean, you know, and, and thank God, Laszlo Kovac, Laszlo Kovacs had just taken off his headphones and wasn't listening when Marty said shut down all the cameras and just kept shooting. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Here's some other questions. What about the, okay, let's see. I mean, I don't know if we want. I don't want to get into more of this Robbie no. Avon stuff. Let's let's not do it. Um, you know, we understand that. You know, it's uh, I'm, you can't say that Robbie somehow appropriated Helm's life story for his songs. That's absurd. It's no. absurd. No. You know. No. And 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 then songwriters get influences. I mean, they you know it comes from right. everything. Right. Right, exactly. So, you know, um, I, that's, I think that's all we have. I think, I think we wrap it up, don't you think? I think it's been a wonderful hour of talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. Great. Thank you, Mark. So I appreciate it. Everyone should buy this book. It's a really, uh, it's a really entertaining book. Jonathan's life is really good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and support book two. Book Soup has been a wonderful store for so very long, and it continues. Yeah. You know, and I we do have some that. signed books. You know, I used to go there, John, when it was just like it was one little room. Do you remember this? I know, I remember. Like a ladder going up, and I, yeah. I got a. They used to have Book Soup charge cards. <laughs> <laughs> you can charge books. Bad idea. It was crazy. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Mark.
Okay. I appreciate it. So long. Thanks Great. so much for being with us. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And everyone take care. Congrats again, Jonathan. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your night. Okay. Great.